I love restorative dentistry, but the thing I always enjoyed the least, I guess, is dentures. Complete dentures because I had a bit of experience and I did a restorative post and I did loads of complete dentures. I quite enjoyed. But chrome dentures, for whatever reason, demographics, exposure, I didn't get enough chance to practice the art of chrome dentures. And to be honest with you, I never got on with surveyors and I never really understood denture design. Now, fast forward many years and I started to get a more elderly patient base and the demand for good quality denture work increased. So I had to match that demand and I've been relying too much on my technicians to help me with the denture design and touch wood, I've had some good results so far. And what that did it inspired me to learn more. I want to take control of the denture design now. Hence why I've got Finlay Sutton coming next month. So now it's December in January 2023. He's coming to Reading. I'm bringing him down south because I'm allergic to the north and I'm just so excited to start implementing everything he's teaching. But this episode will go a long way in teaching you about the philosophy of Scandinavian chrome dentures as well as for the younger dentists every single sequence of chrome denture provision, what is done at each appointment and why you do it in that order. Hello Patrice Rati, I'm Jazz Galanti and welcome back to the Patrice Dental Podcast. It's almost coming to the end of 2022. It's been a crazy year for the podcast. We've had so many episodes. We launched the app this year. Like I am so proud of what our team put together. Thank you for hundreds of you who've been downloading on iOS and Android and sending the feedback and good vibes overall. So I really appreciate that. This episode, like 98% of the episodes of Protrusive are eligible for CE or CPD certificates. All you have to do at the end is answer a few questions to validate your learning and my team will email you a certificate. You can also get early access to the episode. You get exclusive monthly content. So last month it was the full mouth case discussion with Alan. This month is a through the loop view of fitting four ceramic units. This is not found anywhere but on the app only. And in the future, we've got Verti Prep for Plonkers course exclusively on the app and loads more to look forward to. So if you're a true Pratruserati, download the app right now on iOS or Android, or if you'd like to consume it all for the web, go to protrusive.app. Today's Protrusive Dental Pearl is actually going to be read out and spoken by Finn himself. First ever Protrusive Dental Pearl, which is spoken to by my guest. Finn, take it away. Okay, so I think the most difficult things with partial dentures are designing them. And so what I've come up with is a universal design sheet and sequence. So it covers all aspects of missing teeth. So all of the different combinations and patterns of tooth loss. I've got two sheets which you can laminate, just print it off, laminate, put it in the surgery, and then you can then apply that to any case that comes in. So it covers both teeth with good prognosis, the good support teeth, and it also covers teeth with dubious prognosis that may need to be added onto. So I think that's the, the main pearl here. And But the other thing I think is really important with top tips and things like this is, it really is attention to detail. So getting really good at dentures does take training and practice and dedication and reading, you know, so it's not gonna happen overnight, but like anything that is hard to do, that's worth doing, it's hard to do, really. So really go for it, thank you. So if you want access to this PDF, there's two ways to get it. One is if you have the app already, you go to the Protrusive Vault. It's been uploaded to the Protrusive Vault already. And number two is if you go on www.protrusive.co.uk forward slash denture dash design, that's denture dash design. You'll be able to download this very comprehensive design document that I heavily encourage laminating and using as an aid memoir for when you're designing your dentures. Let's join the main episode with Finlay Sutton. Finlay Sutton, welcome again to the Protrusive Dental Podcast. How are you, my friend? I'm really good, thank you. It's great to be here. It's so nice to have you after that really epic episode. We did episode 56, which you covered so much ground. Really, mm -hmm. like we talked everything from chrome dentures for Bruxis to ideal design to immediate dentures. And we had lots of questions from the community and that was just brilliant. And I am super excited, Finn, to be learning from you next month. It's, it's been one of my, in terms of courses, on my bucket list to make sure I get to see Finn and I want to learn partial dentures because... I'll be honest, a little confession, I'm really bad at them. But So that's why I wanted to come to you to learn. Uh, but you're too far away from me, you're in Lancashire. So I'm bringing you down to Reading. It's a sold out course and uh, we are just absolutely buzzing to, to host you. <laughs> absolutely, so am I. Well, thanks very much, Jazz. I'm super excited about doing that. And it's going to be really, really practical because I think that's 
the end of the day, that's what we do as a subject. You know, we are dentists and we treat people, patients. So, and that's what it's all about. It's just case after case after case that will be shown um, with a little bit of work done by you and the delegates too, because what I'll be wanting you to do is to design the case before I actually show it. And then I'll then show the case and tweak the whole thing. Because at the end of the day, what I'm really wanting is for every delegate to go away knowing how to design a partial denture, a really good partial denture for any patient that comes in through the door. It's as simple as that. That's what I want to do. And that's exactly, that's exactly what I need, because although I've been doing a lot more uh, chrome work and partial dentures over the last three years, just patient demographics has changed over my career in the last nine, ten years, I am relying far too much on my lab to do the designing for me, and I'm going by their best judgment. And so I can't wait for that all to change when I am a little bit more savvy on designing. So that practical exercise that you've got inside that course that you plan, I think that'd be really key for learning. And I know you've been teaching all over the world for so many years and you're, you refine the art of education. And uh, personally, from, from seeing you speak, a more didactic, like big, you know, 400 plus kind of sessions. By the way, we, me and Finn were just talking. Finn recently lectured at IMAX theatre, which is just mind blowing. But even then, you were just so such a brilliant educator. Your energy is wonderful. So thanks again for, for coming on today. We're talking about Scandinavian partial dentures. Now, I was having to think about this, Finn, and I was thinking, a dentist who scrolls across on Spotify or on the app or on, on YouTube and, and comes across this term, what, what could that mean to them? And maybe some dentists might think like Ikea, like they may think, does, does a patient just build their own partial denture? Is this like the Smile Direct Club for, for, for Chrome dentures? <laughs> uh, what are Scandinavian partial dentures? What makes it Scandinavian? Okay, so I, I've thought about this and it's something that people ask me all the time. What I think is really important is that if we go right back to basics and the way that I was educated in the UK here, that my textbook was this, which was the Davenport and Heath, Basker, Davenport and Heath. And this is very, very much like the British Dental Journal textbook on it. Mm -hmm. And if you notice here in this design there, we've got a few of these little struts coming up there, little minor connectors. And these sorts of things are in the Scandinavian principle, crossing the gingival margin like that in the interproximal area. These are areas that patients can't actually clean. It really is mm -hmm. a no-no. It's breaking the rules completely. So the, the overall concept about that, it's a hygienic approach to design. And the other thing is, the other Bible that I used when I was doing my specialist training was McCracken's here. And this is the latest edition, or it certainly, it, there may be a, new, a newer edition, but look at this partial denture on here. And this partial denture there. And just describe a, it for our audio listeners. If you don't mind just describing it. That that has a plate on it. So there's a plate design. And if you imagine a, a plate, it's a if you've got a freehand saddle, bilateral freehand saddle on a lower denture, if there's a plate covering the gingival margins, what's gonna happen underneath that plate whilst it is worn? Just think about the plaque retention, the accumulation, the inflammation that causes. And the Scandinavians have got 50 years of research to show that if things are covered like that, on the gingival margins like a plate, it really increases periodontal problems and also caries too. So the whole concept about the Scandinavian approach is to keep it open. So where the gingival margins of the teeth are, then we don't want, I don't want any componentry crossing the gingival margin because any component that's there increases inflammation. So I think the best way to try to visualize this is that if we've got any missing teeth there, we've got underneath that, we've got the base. So we could call that the sublingual bar or the lingual bar or the palate, the plate at the top, the major connector at the top. So they're the bases. And all the bits for the denture come off that base. So when we've got the base mm -hmm. there, 
If we've got a missing T saddle, we just want the minor connector to come up into that saddle area and then rest on the teeth either side of that saddle area. So everything sweeps up into the saddles and onto the teeth. So with the Scandinavian concept, if the dent is made really well, we should be able to get TP into dental brushes between all of the teeth with the denture mm -hmm. in place, with it in place. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think that's I think that's brilliant. And I think the, the data that I used to come across uh, as a DCT and restorative when I wrote the paper on resin and bridges many years ago, uh, it was that partial dentures in the literature are likely to increase your caries or incidence by three times. And, and, and it's been shown that there's conflicting studies, but some studies show that you're more likely to get periodontal disease or caries. But I guess it depends a lot on how you design it. And one lecture I remember going to was is an implant-based lecture, even though I don't do implants. I just remember very clearly a really good point the educator made, Finn. He said that you have to be very careful with a patient who is a dentalist because what they have gone through in their life to get to that stage is like a lot of disease processes, a lot of neglect to some degree to be able to end up in that position. So when we're doing, when you're doing your implants, be mindful of that. And maybe that's why you know, peri-implantitis happens. Now, if you apply that same concept to partial denture wearers, then maybe part of the reason why they lost the teeth is, is the reason they may lose the teeth again. So it just makes sense to make them uh, as cleansable as possible. Do you also apply a Scandinavian approach to acrylic partial dentures or is this philosophy exclusive to chrome work? So it is exclusive to chrome work and I 100% agree with what you said previously about patients that have got multiple missing teeth. You know, they've suffered disease processes, but the beauty about these Scandinavian approaches, and it is, you touched on it perfectly then, because they are removable resin bonded bridges. That's what they are. Mm -hmm. And this is the other difference between Scandinavian and the way that was taught in Britain. The rest seats in the Scandinavian approach are much bigger and wider, smoother, and we have backings and support on the anterior teeth too. So, and they are just like a resin bonded bridge wing, like the retainer part. Mm -hmm. And the beauty about these are, and it's very important for these patients that are going to be potentially losing teeth in the future, because, you know, we don't have a crystal ball, how long everyone's teeth are going to last. The prognosis is quite often dubious for these cases I don't like taking teeth out. And I know you love teeth as well. Natural teeth are fantastic. Let's keep them. Even if they are not great teeth, we can put a backing on them. We can add to it in the future. So these things are totally future-proof. Now, if we then move on to acrylic-based dentures, and my personal opinion about acrylic-based dentures are they are temporary appliances. I totally get that if we're working in a healthcare system like, say, the NHS, we may not be able to provide a metal-based denture for a patient. So I think it's important to retain good prosthodontic principles. So, for instance, if we've got a free-end saddle and we're going to be providing an acrylic-based denture, then extend it fully right up the retromolar pad so you've got good support on the lower. Same for the upper. Use the palate... It's brilliant for support. And use the tuberosity for support too. You know, that's really important. Essentially, though, acrylic dentures are temporary appliances. They are gum strippers, unfortunately, because it's hard to get tooth support. This is the important concept for the Scandinavian approach. Tooth support is king. If we can rest the denture on the teeth and it's not sinking into the soft tissues, stripping the gums, then that's brilliant. Now, and this is really important, having a great technician, sometimes, a very, very occasionally, I have made a long-term acrylic denture for a patient. Now, but in pa these... Partial, you mean like long-term partial acrylic denture, right? Long-term partial acrylic. And this chap had missing two to two, he had retained three, four, and then missing posteriority. So this nice sort of symmetrical situation. So we made an acrylic based denture, but Rowan fashioned little metal rests 
out of 0.9 millimeter wire, which you'd use for normally mm -hmm. for making clasps with. But if you bash the end, you can flatten it. <laughs> and then, then we had little rest seats on both sides. So one on the four, one on the three on both sides, which meant that that acrylic based denture had a rest. So it stopped it from sinking in as much. Obviously, the main... And then in that scenario, what what, yeah. what made you then continue with that long-term partial acrylic denture rather than uh, either going for chrome in the outset? Yeah. Was it periodontal reasons? Was it prognosis reasons? Or was it support reasons? No, it was actually because of finance for this particular patient. Um, so mm -hmm. it, was, it was less expensive to do this. But I don't normally have my arm twisted with that type of thing. It's normally... The acrylic is a temporary, and generally they are immediate dentures, which are used for when I've taken out hopeless teeth and then replaced them, and then that immediate denture then becomes a definitive, which is a metal-based Scandinavian concept. So that's it's a really important thing. And the reason that I don't do... There's two big reasons I don't do acrylics as long-term partials is that number one, they break and snap and crack and patients come in for repairs. If a patient, and when they come to see me, that so I would say, if I was doing an acrylic-based denture, then it would maybe four to five thousand pounds to do that. So a patient will be cross if that breaks. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that's so they are very much a temporary appliance for the patient. And secondly, they're just really good as a diagnostic tool as well. The great, you know, if we're taking out a load of teeth, I can put this immediate Mark One in. I call them Mark One dentures. Mark One goes in. <laughs> I love that. That's a diagnostic appliance, and then we can then move on to Mark Two later on. So when patients come to see me, that's how I plan them. They're always Mark One and Mark Two if we need to extract teeth. Amazing. And, and when I come to your course next month, I've got a couple of cases on the go who are wearing Mark 1s and I'm going to design my Mark 2s, the chromes, when I come to see you and, and learn from you. And really interesting, one's an 80-year-old chap who I did an alveolar plasty because he had severe over-eruption of his anteriors and too much bone, not enough space for the teeth, aesthetic looking yeah. teeth. So I did an alveolar plasty, a bit of surgery, and now he's wearing a Mark 1 he's very happy with, but he needs a lot of general dentistry, crown work, restorative work. And so I'm really looking forward to that, that fun case and a few other which uh, I've had an honest conversation with him. I said, look, I'm going to go to this guy called, called Finn. I'm going to learn from him. Give me a couple of months. When I come back from the course, let me design you a denture. And they've been fine with it. They've understood that what they have in this acrylic partial denture uh, is a Mark I. Uh, and, and I show them an example of a, of a chrome and discuss the benefits. And patients are on board with that. I, I digress a little bit, but I just wanted to ask you, because this is a thought that I've had, is upper complete acrylic dentures, which uh, mm. I know you do lots of education on and it's a, it's a beautiful art and your videos on suction from them, upper and lower, is just uh, amazing. When would you consider an upper complete denture with a chrome base? What are the indications? Because I've seen a few of those. I've done one in the past. I couldn't tell you what the reason rationale was behind at the time, but I'd like to hear it from you. Okay, quite simply, uh, the metal base strengthens the denture. It reduces the potential for it to fracture and it reduces the potential for an unhappy patient because if the denture breaks, it's quite easy to fix, but it's quite difficult to repair the patient's confidence in it. And uh, they, mm. you know, have... So, as a rule, this is how I go. And I always break the rules because there are certain circumstances that we have to... But anyway, generally, as a rule, if I'm doing a complete denture opposing natural dentition, which is called the combination syndrome... I'll use a metal reinforcing base in the denture. So that's number one. Number two, I do it for implant supported dentures. So if I've got an implant supported lower, you know, with two lovely locators, really secure bottom denture, biting onto a complete upper, again, metal reinforce the upper, and also obviously the lower two, you know, the implant supported denture. If there are any implants in the maxilla as well, and I'm doing a full upper over denture on implants, metal reinforce always because of particular chewing. And then the other, I think the fourth reason is history of breakage. 
if a patient comes in and they've got an old denture that has got this wire in because they've fractured it previously and maybe they're very worn the teeth, bruxist tendencies, because bruxism still occurs in patients that have got no teeth. So it's really just to add that extra strength. Just as a little caveat, just at the end, why don't I do it for everybody? Well, getting retention on an upper denture with a metal base is slightly more difficult because it is marginally heavier. It's just a t only mm. a few grams. We're talking like a metal reinforced upper complete denture is 25 grams, whereas a, an acrylic base is usually around about 19, 20 grams-ish. So that can just slightly offset retention if we've got a very flat maxilla and also if we've got a patient who's got high frenal attachments that means when they smile and talk that frenum exposes the edge of the denture and the seal the peripheral seal breaks so it's those two cases where mm. i'd say to them look i prefer to do an acrylic based denture for you it's more likely to break would you like a spare as well you know so mm -hmm. i then offer a spare so then they can wear one on a monday the other on a tuesday and swap it and they're, they're wearing them together I think uh, that was an emphatic answer for that question. That was absolutely brilliant. I really love that. So when you have a metal base, how does that compare to an acrylic upper complete denture with a wire mesh inside? Is that just a waste of time or uh, does that have some benefit in terms of giving it rigidity? Uh, the only benefit of a wire mesh is that it, if the denture snaps or cracks the acrylic, then the two edges are still held together. So it's not a catastrophic failure for the patient. It'll still be very uncomfortable and not great, but it's, say they're on holiday and it happens, they can probably limp along until they get it sorted. But they don't offer anything other than that. And sometimes we, Rowan and I think they actually weaken it. And then the other mm. aspect of a metal base in the upper is what's really important is to have an acrylic post dam. That's crucial. So the denture has a better peripheral seal and also we can reline the denture should it need it as well, which um, it just makes it future-proof, much better suction. Lovely little gem there. The next question I have as we get towards the, the end of the questions is, it's quite a big high-level question and I think to, to make it tangible, this is aimed more at uh, the young dentists who are starting to make their first few dentures or the, more, the slightly more experienced dentists like me who just doesn't get to make enough volume of chrome dentures and it's nice to revise we can make like a little handout for this is what are the stages in general obviously there are nuances and you have to deviate away from the rules but a very standard patient for a partial denture what are the titles the sequences of the appointments and how many appointments would you typically take so i think if we look at it really i'm looking at a list here and on average to fit a chrome, it's seven visits for a metal-based denture. I'm talking about metal-based dentures. So let's go visit one. So we've got our consultation with the patient in. We have a look in the mouth. We make a diagnosis. I take a photo. And from that, I then do my first design because that goes into the patient's letter. And that's my first thing. I get my first design done, number one. The first active treatment is at visit two. And that is primary impressions. So I do my primary impressions to record the whole thing. And from that, I then, Rowan pours those models, we cast them up, and then we can have a look at it. And we can finalise that design. So I say to Rowan, this is what I want to do. This is my aim and design. This is the, the model here. And then we put it on the surveyor and we have a look at it. And Rowan says to me, Yes, we can do that. Or no, we need to make minor changes, you know, of that. You know, mm -hmm. he'll say, look, sometimes it's just not possible. I'll, I'll say something that he can't actually do. He might not have enough space to put a tooth in a place. So, anyway, it's just a good discussion. So we do the definitive design then. And he'll tell me, right, Finn, I want you to take a little bit off the teeth here for the guiding surfaces or make some space for rest seats in these areas because just like with resin bonded bridges, they have to fit 
in and out. So sometimes we'll have an undercut. You know, the lingual surfaces of the lower teeth go inside like that. I might just have to shave a little mm -hmm. bit off to make it level. I, I just want to make a point there, Finn. Uh, just sorry to interrupt, but uh, that's such a, a huge point because uh, path of insertion, often dentists think that path of insertion is applicable to removal dentures. We think of dentures, path of insertion, path of removal, but resin bonded bridges and indirect work also needs a path of insertion and it becomes extra important with rigid materials like chrome denture work to mm. visualize that path of insertion. And it doesn't often need much prep. It just needs a little bit. I personally use like red flame diamond burrs, soft yeah. flex discs just to get those uh, planes is that what you use as well absolutely all the time just little tickles i call it dusting of the teeth more than grinding <laughs> just like just shaving a touch off just I to like that. everything to fit so absolutely so visit one is design prelim exam visit two is primary impressions definitive design visit three is then definitive impressions. So my working impressions, and I always say to the patient, this is the most important. This is the most important visit of the whole thing because I'm wanting the whole, this thing to fit and I need to record your mouth exactly as it is. So I'll do my adjustments and then I'll then do my working impressions. And then visit four will be jaw registration. So, and that'll be, you know, wax rims or a gothic arch tracing if I want to find CR. I'm either making the dentures in intercuspal position or I'm making them in centric relation. So that's my jaw edge, mm -hmm. number three. Number four. At that stage, do you take a Facebook record, you personally? Yes, I do. Do you take a Facebook record? Yeah, you do. Yeah, cool. yeah, I do a Facebook as well. So now mm -hmm. just going back to intercuspal position, and this is really important, this is where there's not a set rule of, of thumb in terms of visits. Sometimes I can actually skip a stage if I'm doing my working impressions and the patient's got a really stable intercuspal position and those models can be mounted really easily, then I don't need to do a jaw reg at that. I, I don't need yes. to have an extra jaw reg visit. I can put a futar D bite in and just do that if need be. Or quite often they just fit together beautifully just by wrist articulating, you know, so. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then mount. A resticulator. Resticulator is really good. It, all, everything fits together beautifully <laughs> like that. So normally, though, I will do a bite, a jaw registration at visit four, isn't it? I think we're at now. I've got my list. And then visit five. I've lost track as well. <laughs> so let's do, so primary imps is one, definitive imps two, bite at three. Number four will be try-in, tooth try-in mm -hmm. at this point. This is with the chrome and the wax attached together. No, 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 definitely. And this is a common sort of misconception. The chrome is made after the try-in is done. Got it. And the reason being, just like we wouldn't put implants in randomly in the mouth without having knowing where we're going to put the teeth to start off with, I want to engineer the chrome to be in the perfect position to where the teeth are going to be placed. So the chrome mm -hmm. try-in comes after, just purely the chrome try-in comes after the tooth try-in. So mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. tooth try-in. And then it's chrome try-in, and then it's finish after that. Now, with the chrome, so it's tooth try-in to check the aesthetics and make sure the chrome will be in the right place, I guess. There is a place for the chrome. You might modify your design based on the tooth try-in. But then when you go to the stage after the tooth try-in, and just to clarify, the tooth try-in is wax and acrylic teeth. That's it, right? Yes, it is. And then the visit after, it's chrome, wax, and teeth together. Uh, no, no, it isn't. No, the, the, oh, the, okay. it's purely bare chrome try-in without teeth on. Got it. And with these Scandinavian dentures, there's a lot of tooth-to-tooth -tooth contact. So you've got multiple contacts. So I don't want to have wax teeth getting in the way of me just checking that this chrome framework, the metal base is fitting beautifully. So your, your visualization is improved. Yeah, it is. It's visualizations improved everything. So, so once I know the chrome fits, it's, and I've already done the tooth try in, I can just go mm -hmm. straight to finish. 
Would you recommend for a less experienced colleague, a younger dentist to at that stage, once they've, if they're following your principles and they're learning from this and they want to yeah. apply what they're learning, the tooth try and make sense, the chrome work try and a lot of dentists would do that earlier on in the chain, perhaps after definitive straight away. Yeah. Uh, would you recommend that the, the less experienced dentist or for a tricky patient, maybe to do a chrome and tooth try and together where everything's in wax still? Or do you feel, do you truly feel that has no benefit and rather is better to go to the fit if you've already done a separate tooth try and and a separate chrome trine. Yeah. So th- the only circumstance that I would do a add in an extra stage of doing the chrome and teeth would be if Rowan, when he's setting the teeth up and arranging them, feels that there may be a little change in the tooth positions from the first try in to the finished denture. If he feels that There may be some very important retentive elements on front teeth. It'll only be the front, it's the aesthetic zone stuff, if there may be some changes that he has to make or we have to thin the teeth down so much that the colour may change as well. Because when we, you know, when they're ground out at the back, the colour changes. It's really, if there's going to be an aesthetic change, that's when we do a metal try with teeth on, try in. So got it, got it. Yeah, that's just purely. So essentially, if we go back, let's. We just need to recap this. This is quite an important concept. So normally, and I'm just doing it on my computer here because I've got it here. So we've got number one, primary impressions. Number two, working impressions. Number three is the jaw registration, tooth prescription. Number four is tooth try-in. Number five is metal base try, bare metal base try. And then number six is fit. And then it's reviews after that. That's my general rule of thumb approach. I take, since, since all everything I picked up from you from episode 56 about trying in dentures and using a clued spray, you taught us so much. And I, and I took a lot away from that. And even just from that, the last four chromes I fitted, the patients come back at review and there's no ulcer, there's no adjustments, the occlusion's spot on, everything's been really good. So either I've just got lucky or I really implemented everything you taught me from that short podcast episode and, I, and I've gained a lot from that. So tell me what do you usually see because you take so much care and time to, to get these right and various stages. And, and for those who need it, a gothic arch tracing, if you're repositioning the, the, the bite, do you often have to do much adjustments at the reviews and uh, how many uh, appointments are included when you, when you quote a patient for a fee? In terms of quoting correctly, how many uh, review appointments do you build into that fee? So I build in two um, because on average, and I've reviewed my cases since introducing the Scandinavian concept, and on average I have 1.7 reviews per patient with metal-based dentures. So quite often it's just like one review and then we're off we go. So it really works beautifully. And interestingly, the way that I was taught the, the sort of British standard approach, the reason that I changed to the Scandinavian approach was that I wasn't getting good consistent results and it wasn't predictable. And on average, in my specialist practice, and I was a specialist at this stage, I was reviewing my patients four times. I had to see them four times Mm -hmm. with the sort of RPI system and that sort of system that I used to learn approach. So it's much better. So it's really, I just find it remarkable that virtually it's between one and two uh, review visits. Mm Mm-hmm. It's amazing. Like, well, I think um, I definitely need to, to to buy my technician a bottle of wine because I think uh, kudos to my tech. He's been doing a great job, and he helps. He's helped me a lot with my design, Finn. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm hoping to change that so yeah. I can I can lead the design, helped by yeah. him. You know what? It makes me really happy that you have that success from this. It's really wonderful that you know your patients are benefiting from this. It's lovely. So uh, great. Oh, it's, it's great. I have so much more more confidence in, in delivering uh, partial dentures, and 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 it's a really important thing to uh, to cover. I'm starting to get a reputation now, Finn, to help drive the areas of dentistry which are not perceived as sexy. So treating TMD in general practice, occlusal appliances. I recently hosted an acupuncture course in, in, in Reading with David Johnson who came by. They did a wonderful thing. Now with occlusion, we're doing a lot of work with occlusion. So things that aren't considered sexy and now obviously one of the reasons to bring you on is because 
some people, a lot of dentists, they'll go on the composite courses, they'll go on the Botox, facial aesthetics, but partial denture education, I feel, is something that's so necessary of dental school. And uh, I think guys like you and my good friend Rupert are, are really, and, and, and Mark Bishop, you guys are making a rural pro sexy. So I, I have so much respect for all of you and I keep doing what you're doing. But I think young dentists need to appreciate that we need to charge appropriately for these amazing devices that are just a, a miracle when you look at it. It's a work of art. It truly is art. How much, if you don't mind disclosing, do, do, your, do your cases typically cost in terms of patients in terms of your, your, your fee for an average, like you described, the average sequence? And I think this will hopefully help people realize that we're undercharging. Just like I teach, we undercharge for occlusal appliances grossly. I think we undercharge for partial dentures, but you probably have a stronger opinion on that than me. Absolutely. So I think that my average fee for a metal-based denture for one single is it's about £10,000. And I, I think that it's really, first of all, they are worth it. And you've touched on this beautifully just then when you were talking about they are works of art. Now, I strongly believe, and I would be, I'd love to stand up and with these implant people that just really are extremely dismissive of partial dentures. And I'd like to have a battle with them and say, and actually, <laughs> right, okay, which looks better? You know, a really good mm. partial denture. What is aesthetically superior when someone's got a high smile line and missing teeth? Missing. So the best way to replace the missing tissues is with a partial denture. If we have a really really skilled technician and there's a great clinician doing working together as a team i think we can beat hands down fixed prosthodontics you know with with this i think the detracting factor of a partial is we've got are the clasps and you know those mm. clasps have to be hidden some way you know we use gold and we put them back as far as possible that's the main detracting factor um, and also the thing is removable. So the patients do have, you know, within within the dental protect profession, we have negative connotations about dentures and also within the general it's public true. too. So, but, you know, like we're both, both of us are, are pushing these non-sexy areas of dentistry because I think <laughs> they are sexy. I do. I think, uh, you know, we I restore patients' lives. I totally change their life with these, mm -hmm lumps of plastic and metal and i probably change them better with these sorts of things than with you know with fixed restoration where it's extremely hard to engineer gum work to look like natural gums the white is not too bad to deal with you know the teeth themselves but the gum work is and i do believe that we should charge for these sorts of things too and i think the ultimate test bed, and I used to work in the hospital system. I was a consultant at Manchester Dental Hospital, and I was would be treating patients with cleft lip and palate and with mis, you know big defects and that type of thing. And also normal patients who would be referred in, as in patients without these problems but were difficult denture cases, I'd get to the end of the road with them and some, some of them maybe weren't totally happy with the outcome, but I could say to them, look, we tried everything here and the patient would buy that because they're not paying directly for the system. You know, I'd, they'd actually say, okay, consultant, you know, professor, I know you tried your best and they'd accept that. Now, it totally changed when I went into practice and worked as a high street specialist mm -hmm. taking referrals that patients would come in and then I'd be charging, you know, between five and ten thousand pounds for a denture. If the denture wasn't totally right and the patient wasn't totally happy with it, I couldn't say to them, oh, we've tried everything, I'm really sorry now, and then off they go and they're a happy camper. Not at all. So this is why I had to change from what I was previously taught to something more predictable. And this is where meeting John Besford, who is a, he's a very old dentist now. You know, he's in his 80s, but he's probably one of the best British removable prosthodontists ever, who learnt off Charlotte Stilwell, who's the Danish prosthodontist that brought it to Britain. She brought this concept here. She's a specialist, as Charlotte mm -hmm. works in London. And I went on a course, and it completely changed the way I did things. 
you know. So, and that's why I learned the Scandinavian concept. So, my reviews went from four and not very happy patient to two and happy patients. Amazing. And it was amazing. And also, like yourself, you will, Jazz, you'll be understanding that you sort of engineer a practice to the type of work you want to do and the type of patients that you want to treat. And that happens over time Absolutely. as well. So there's something really important as well about this is that I only do two clinical days a week treating patients now. I'm 51. I do another day, which will be it's today actually. I'm I'm actually doing online Zoom consults with new patients and phone calls just to filter them out and make sure they're okay for coming in. Now, I find that two clinical days is enough for me because my patients are referred to me, so they're quite difficult. They may be technically challenging, and most are technically challenging, but also they do have personality issues, potential personality disorders, where the dentist that's referred them in has just found them hard to manage. So they're quite tricky Mm -hmm, to, mm -hmm. to cope with. So now I personally can only really handle two days of working with these types of patients. So each day I'll be seeing maybe six patients a day. Four of them will be lovely, absolutely great, but two will be really hard to manage and will really test my metal and my patients. So I I find that two days is absolutely enough to keep my sort of mental health Good. Now, in order to do that, though, I have to charge a lot of money to sustain. It's like like two days of intense work to keep me in a living. So therefore, my hourly rate is currently £750 per hour of clinical work Mm -hmm. in order to, you know, fund that. Uh, that process. So hopefully that just sort of explains my situation, Jazz. It, it, it does wonderfully. And I think we should appreciate the how much care, attention, experience that you have behind you. Also having a specialist status. But uh, the reason for asking you that question, and Finn, thanks for, for answering it honestly and, and, and gi- giving it all away. I really appreciate that because I think dentists need some inspiration that actually everything we do, when we put so much thought and care into it and to adopt a, a mindset whereby A, you're worth it and B, not to undersell yourself because these patients are tough and sometimes the difference you can make even from a single reservoir and bridge. Like I speak to dentists all the time who are just way undercharging for a single unit reservoir and bridge. I'm like, forget that it's a reservoir and bridge and not an implant. You are giving that patient a tooth. You are yeah. giving the, you're restoring the patient's smile. Yeah. And then once they think of it like that, but patients also you know, compare it to an implant and they shouldn't be that much different to they, you know, they shouldn't be like one is like 300 pounds, the other is 3,000. No way in it. It should be a, a, a charge much more properly. Now, when you apply that to denture work, I mean, it's very obvious that you're restoring someone's function and aesthetics in a huge way. And you just have to subscribe to Finn's newsletters to see the amazing work. So I'll, I'll put a link at the bottom for that. For anyone who would like to join the waiting list for the course in Reading on the 13th and 14th of January, please email me, DM me, we'll get you on. So we're looking forward to, to learning from you, Finn. And actually, one of the reasons I asked you to, selfishly, one of the reasons I asked you to, to come on, on both Friday and Saturday, and I was really keen to fill those spots, is that we can have you to ourselves on Friday night. We go out for a nice dinner with everyone, a Christmas-themed dinner. Uh, no, not Christmas-themed, it's next month. We'll think of a, a, a new visions, new beginnings uh, kind of dinner. Uh, and I think everyone's really looking forward to just... Uh, Uh, Getting to know the man behind the dentures. So, Finn, thanks so much for discussing Scandinavian dentures, the philosophy. It just makes so much sense. B, telling us uh, all, every little detail. You're so giving with your information. That other episode we did, 56, just I learned so much from that personally. And then I love the the style of education that you developed. So thanks for making dentures sexy again, once again. And I appreciate your time always. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Absolutely. Well, there we have it, guys. Finlay Sutton. Thank you so much, as always, for listening all the way to the end. If you're listening or watching on the app, you can not only download the full transcript, but you can also download the notes. The notes include a sequence-by-sequence cheat sheet, and on the protrusive vault, you can also download the PDF of the pearl he described, which got every single design. So that's all on the app for you if you want it. Alternatively, you can get the cheat sheet, but not the notes on protrusive.co.uk forward slash denture dash design. And if you wanted to come and join us for Finlay Sutton live course in Reading, UK on the 13th of January, 
or the 14th of January. So if you just drop me a DM at Protrusive Dental or email me jazz at protrusive.co.uk and let me know. We'll put you on the waiting list. Thank you, Patricia Rati, and I'll catch you same time, same place next week.